Hi, I'm with, uh, hi, Natalie. Thanks for joining us or Hello. joining me. Hi. So uh, you're, okay. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, your name, your role with Patriot Pictures, and, uh, and we'll start from there. Yeah. So my name is Natalie Perota. I'm the SVP of Patriot Pictures and the executive producer on all of our films that we finance and produce. I've been with the company for 13 years on Monday, which just I just realized that, which is exciting. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. To have any job for 13 years is is a feat. Yeah. And uh, how did how did you get involved with Patriot? And how did you uh, we're gonna talk to you and, and Michael or with Michael later, um, but how did you get involved with Patriot and how did you uh, meet up with Michael? Yeah, so I was after college, I started at a PR firm and I was watching an interview with Larry King live and he was interviewing his executive producer, Wendy Walker. And she was kind of walking through what she did for the last like 20 years of the show with him. And I realized I was like, oh, producing sounds like something I wanna do and I can do that. And the next day I put out my application on entertainmentcareers.net and connected with Michael and the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> We've been so, uh what was what were your thoughts in terms of what a producer did and then the reality of it once you got the job that's a good question um i so i'm a, it's i feel like a producer is just the person that's the most organized person on set and making sure that everyone is seamlessly doing what they're supposed to be doing um while also keeping the camaraderie of the team and the spirit of the creative and also making sure we're on budget and we're on time. Um, a producer wears many hats. And I think that with every film, it's been different. And, you know, sometimes happily, we're the ones like giving you know, making sure everyone has water, making sure on a hot day, everyone's hydrated and making sure that we're hitting our days and our um, schedule and while every project can be very different, I think that it's a very beautiful experience to go with these different teams on each film and kind of we are there to support our creatives and to do anything that we need to do to make sure that we get the project done. Mm -hmm. And is there, has much changed over the 13 years? Like uh, is something significantly different today than it was 13 years ago? Like I guess 2010 we're looking at. No. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, I mean, obviously the, the climate has changed with, you mm -hmm. know, the streaming services and things like that and how we sell our films and how we distribute our films. Um, but it's kind of the basics are always, it hasn't changed. Um, and I think, you know, maybe mo more recently we've been filming out of the country and doing things mm -hmm. um, out of the United States. So that has been a little bit of a, a new road to navigate, but it's been, you know, it's the same rules apply there as anywhere in the world as in the United States. Okay. Well, let's, yeah, let's talk about what's going on with Patriot for the, for 2024. Um, uh, let's see the first one, let's talk about almost popular. Uh, what is that and uh, yeah what can you tell us about it yeah it's a little it's um a really charming coming of age story of uh high schoolers and you know in the vein of napoleon dynamite and little miss sunshine um it's an indie sweetheart it's written by pamela Litter little and it's directed by Nate ramos it's starring Ruby Rose Turner and Isabella Ferrara and Reed Miller. And they're just, you know, young kids trying to figure out what's important. Well, I think that being is the most important thing is they, you know, quickly realize what really is important. And um, it's their journey. And it's a, it's a comedy. It's funny. It's very charming. And we're really excited about it. Mm -hmm. So what was it about the film or the project that? Uh, said that that gave basically gave the green light for it. The team, we believed in the direct. We believe in the director. We really believe in the writer, and you know, seeing our cast come to life and in those roles, it was, it was amazing. We had a strong, very dedicated producer on it, and we, 
you know, we greenlit it as a package, as the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. Versus sometimes I think things are greenlit on just like one cast member or, you know, the director. This one was more greenlit on the whole package and what, how it's going to be in the end versus mm -hmm. one single element. Yeah. So in this case, was it just, uh, uh, you know, the, basically the, the entire package was already put together in terms of writer, director, cast, and, and it's just a matter of presenting it to you, or was that kind of a process? The Well, we actually came in and um, put the cast on with the director and the writer. Um, so we were very involved with each cast member and um, attaching them. And so, you know, we really believed in the director's vision and it kind of came together as a whole. We put on a great casting director who is has, you know, his finger on the pulse in this world of young adults. And, you know, we were really excited about it. Yeah. And um, so a lot of our viewers here are uh, emerging filmmakers. You know, they're people who have been doing low budget DIY type uh, indie films for a while. And I, I, when I was kind of looking up the uh, the director, it was at Nayib Ramos. Mm -hmm. um, you, she's she has some experience in terms of I, I think it was music videos and short films and maybe a little bit of television. Um, what is it about her that that basically said? Uh, what were the qualities in her that you saw that said, okay, she's ready for a first time feature? Yeah, it's actually a gentleman. Um, oh, okay, he... sorry. <laughs> He, uh, he's very, very um, uh, immersed in this world of Disney kids and music direct in music videos. Um, he had a very clear vision behind how he wanted to shoot it. Um, the element, the colors, the scheme, the just the theme of the film. And he, we believe in him and we, were very, you know, very impressed with his body of work. I mean, even his music videos and his TV shows and his commercials, they all say something. And we, you know, just because it's not a film doesn't mean that he's not going to do great with film. So we really took into consideration um, the way he works and his team spirit and how he would really direct these young kids because it was all, you know, it's a young adult film and he hit it out of the park. Oh, great. Um, and mm -hmm. now let's, let's move on. Uh, the second one is Lost in Wonderland. What is that? Uh, it, yeah, I mean, from the description, it's definitely an Alice in Wonderland type story. What, tell us about that. Yeah, it's based on Alice in Wonderland. It was written and directed by Daniela and Miva and we filmed it in Budapest. And we, it's just a journey of a young girl who loses her mom and she's trying to figure out where to spread her mother's ashes. And she goes, while she's figuring that out, she's learning a lot about herself. And she goes on this magical journey, a lot like Alice in Wonderland in Budapest. And we have Ella Javolta and Edward Philomnot and Terrence Howard and Sasha Lust and that rounds out the cast. And it's this beautiful journey through Budapest on, you know, that takes turns and twists and figuring out who she is. Mm -hmm. We did. And, yeah, and we, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And can you talk about the fantasy element of it? I, you know, it's uh, as indie filmmakers, again, um, you know, to take on a genre like that in fantasy, uh, you know, what, what are the challenges you faced or was it more mostly, uh, you know, we're, the, the script was so well written that, uh, you know, that, you know, elements of fantasy were much easier to pull off than, than others. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think you have, we have to be cognizant as, you know, a, a first time director and a smaller budget of the fantasy aspect of it. We teamed up with a really great visual effects house called Fake Studios. Um, and they were able to kind of, get, you know, hit every aspect of the VFX in, in a very budget friendly way. Um, another way that we were able to kind of supplement that was we made sure that the visual effects and, or in the, um, 
the film was done in like a rebate state or country. So we were able to spend more money on the VFX knowing that more money was going to come back in an incentive type program. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another way that, you know, in the indie world, we really try to maximize those opportunities uh, to get more bang for our buck. Yeah. Is there a secret to keeping the, the VFX budget low? <laughs> Cutting the VFX? No. <laughs> Just <kidding. laughs> um, yeah. It's, I think, actually, I think what really helped us on that film is that we had a visual effects uh, supervisor on set um, because sometimes what happens is if you don't have a VFX supervisor actually on set while you're filming these scenes, you might, things might not be set up correctly where, you know, obviously the people on the ground are filming a certain way that we don't know what it'll look like on the back end of what the v actual VFX artists may need. So it was very helpful for us to have a supervisor on set to kind of be like, well, maybe instead of blocking it this way, you should do it like this and, you know, whatever the little pieces of advice were in order to make sure that when it got to the back end mm -hmm. and to the artist, they it was a seamless process versus them having to fix it in other ways that yeah. could have easily been fixed on set. So yeah. that is an extra expense while you're filming, but can be very helpful and save you more money in the end. Yeah. Uh, we, mm -hmm. I think it was Catherine Hardwick who told us, uh, pr fix it in prep, you know, be, be yeah. prepared for this stuff rather than try to fix it after, after the fact. Exactly. It's much more expensive to try to fix it after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> and then lastly, uh, Ghost Ships, uh, deep dive documentary. What is that? Yeah, so we basically took, we did an expedition of 15 shipwrecks in the Baltics off the coast of Finland, Sweden, Poland, and Lithuania. And we had 20 divers descend into the Baltic waters and film these shipwrecks um, in a way that have never been filmed. Uh, they were so, it's shot so beautifully. The colors are so amazing. It takes us on an incredible journey just to kind of, um, to respect and to remember these lost souls that were forgotten in these shipwrecks. Um, so it's a, it's a really nice journey amongst many. So we have expert divers, expert, um oceanologists like expert it's just sitting there it's helping in every way on the expedition and really taking you through this great journey mm -hmm. and were you guys involved involved uh from the beginning or did you come in i, I guess i I'm, I'm curious as to when you stepped in into this project Seems yeah like we were in <laughs> We were involved from the beginning, so we helped map out the expedition of what ships we really wanted to focus on. We were involved in um, choosing the ships, and um, we developed it, and we and we shot it. And w Michael was on the boat the entire time, in <laughs> during right at the beginning of the Ukrainian Russian war, yeah. and so it was an iffy time, but you know we were boarded a couple of times um but we have all our permits thank god in line and we we're able to continue but it was definitely an adventure and you can see it through the footage and and see um you know the heart and soul that went behind it with everyone that's involved yeah amazing okay all right you look all beautiful right. natalie <laughs> thank you <laughs> you look good Okay, Michael. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us. So we're talking about uh, talking to Natalie about projects you have coming up in uh, in this year. And uh, we we're just talking about Columbia documentary. And so well, when we shot when we shot this movie, Running with the Devil. Uh huh. We shot it in Santa Fe and Bogota, Medellin, and Cartagena. Uh huh. When did that so one come out? That came out uh, five years ago. Okay. And so they introduced us to these candidates of uh, the new president. This is before the current one. Right. And so we offered to shoot a commercial for a guy named Ivan Duca. Uh-huh. 
And uh, so we took all our guys on a Saturday and shot our first political commercial. Oh, wow. But, you know, he wasn't the favorite to win. Mm -hmm. But uh, he ended up winning, served four years as four president. Years, yeah, because we just covered a documentary about uh, Gustavo Petro, who who is now the current president of, right. uh, of Colombia. Right. And, so uh, we were we did the one before. He was quite a, a gentleman. He posted he wanted us to open a film school for him in uh, Bogota. Mm -hmm. And they all wanted Natalie to run the school. And Natalie <laughs> had a couple things to do other than running uh, the school. Yeah. Aside from moving to Colombia. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we just finished talking about um, the three films you have coming up uh, in 2024. So I, I'm glad you're here because I want to talk about um, just the kind of state of state of uh, Hollywood at the moment. Uh, the strike is over. What are your thoughts post strike now? Uh, everything better? Everything, all the problems solved? Post strike. Well, we're making offers on three different movies. Um, one is called Aquarius, which we hope to star Samuel L. Jackson and Jeffrey Dean Morgan to be directed by Johnny Martin. And then we're making an offer on a movie based on a big book called White Cargo, which is about a uh, high-tech billionaire who is in Colombia, and uh, his on a river between Colombia and Venezuela, his ship gets uh, hijacked by these pirates, Venezuelan pirates, mm -hmm. and uh, he's left for dead. He thinks he's killed his whole family, and he discovers that his daughter's still alive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, he has a, uh, an unusual set of skills from his military special ops training that allows him to go after these pirates. And mm -hmm. he settles the score. Caitlin in our office refers to these as dad movies. <laughs> but, you know, it seems like the market wants them every now and then. Oh, definitely. I mean, weirdly, Beekeeper is one of those movies that that I think people have been waiting for for a long time. Just a straight out action film. Yeah. And so, uh, we, you've already talked about Almost Popular. Yeah, we talked mm -hmm. about Almost Popular, Lost in Wonderland, and Ghost Ships. It's turning out that the soundtrack for Almost Popular is incredible. I won't tell you who the songs are, but one artist is bigger than the other. We can't stop them from coming on to a teen movie. I've never seen it before. Incredible. Well, let me ask you, uh, speaking of the strike, um, you know, I, I, the last time we talked about it, I think we were in, we were definitely in the middle of the writer's strike and not quite yet into the actor's strike. Um, but now that we're out of it, uh, you know, it, to me, the strikes always seem to be the, the battle between it's the big studios and then the, the unions. And it, I feel like that uh, your your particular studio uh, is just kind of going along for the ride and to see what settles once it's all over. Um, I mean, is, is much different after the strike for you guys or has have things fundamentally changed? Well, first of all, we knew the strike was coming, so we made two movies in June. I'm sure mm -hmm. Natalie told you. And uh, a friend of mine, Michael Rotenberg, he's the manager of George Lopez. So they wanted George Lopez to play uh, the father of this family that had Mariana Trevino and Emily Tosta. Have you told him about this movie, Natalie? Is that that gringo yeah. who stole Christmas? Yeah. We haven't talked yeah. about it yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I mean, the, the gringo that stole Christmas was a hit on Stars, and now is number one on Hulu for family movies. It's uh, and we never expected it. And the guys at Grindstone, Stan and Barry, and the director Angel and Grace and Romy and Natalie—they just knocked it out of the park. 
I, they made the movie in four and a half months from start to finish. So it was done for October to be released in December. I've never seen a movie in 35 years made that quickly. I'm looking to get a job with Natalie and Grace one day. <laughs> I think what said, you know, what we were able to do by filming right before the strikes and having and taking that time during the strikes to edit two films, um, we really were able to use that time wisely. And then as well as focus a lot on our development and our packaging of projects and um, focusing on kind of the future of the company. And now that the strikes are over, I think the only the thing that we just hired in a little bit more of a competition with is getting the actors availability because like, you know, weddings during COVID when everything gets pushed, all the projects get pushed, dates become harder to fight for. Um, but other than that, we kept our heads down and we kept working and we kept, you know, developing and we were editing and, you know, we were very fortunate to be able to, to kind of time two movies exactly they ended the day that the first strike that the actor strike was supposed uh -huh. to start on june 30th obviously it was pushed a couple weeks but um which would have been great to know at the time of filming because we would have had a couple more days but um we really tried to capitalize on that and to keep ourselves busy um which we were able to do yeah and that was the gringo stole christmas and what was the other film <laughs> Almost and we popular. filmed almost popular. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yeah, and so that gets you ready right now when when it's done, and you know, do all the post production. Um, exactly. But I, I guess I am curious though as to uh, you know was was for from your perspective was the strike merely just a a pause in the availability of writers and actors, or was there uh, a fundamental way that that you do business? Because uh, to me, it sounds like it, it may not have been uh, there may not have been a big change in the way. You, you do business now? Well, there were a couple of things that I do think were important. The AI, generative AI function of being able to write things through chat GBT concerned the writers. But for the time that we've played on chat GBT, I, I don't think it's more than a research mm -hmm. vehicle. It, it can't write a script. It can't do dialogue. It's not at this point, any challenge to the talented writers that we work with. Mm -hmm. However, for the actors, the studios, when they make these movies, they own those characters. And so when they sign Brad Pitt or George Clooney or, or Emily Blunt, they own those characters and those actors in those characters. So for them to be able to put dialogue and words and voices to those characters without the permission of the actor, to me seems a bit unfair. And that was one of the big issues for these actors. And uh, I'm 100% supportive of them. Mm -hmm. However, the characters are owned by the company. So, you know, what can we do if we own a character? We have to make something with that character. We just can't put words in someone else's mouth mm -hmm. that weren't, weren't there originally. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for that. Um, let, let me shift gears a bit. And another thing we talk about a lot uh, on our podcast and live stream is, uh, you know, I, I think for, our, for us and our fans, we are very much movie theater people. Um, we, I think we would choose... Uh, to go to a movie theater and watch it on television, and we would try to support that. But um, is it that where there's too few of us, or do you think that uh, do, what do you what do you think is the prospects of the movie theater uh, this year and 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 beyond? I'm with you. I love movie theaters. Mm -hmm. First movie I saw in a theater was Sting. Oh, yeah. Paul Newman and Robert Redford. Yeah, we were just talking about that one the other day and Godfather and Apocalypse Now. How do you actually see those? The place that I was staying in Paris, I stay there because there's a classic movie theater just across the street. So I've been able to see Frank Sinatra movies. I saw a movie that we financed called Fight Club 
there this last week. Nobody of the young people I was with saw Fight Club in the theater. It was amazing. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I talked to one uh, filmmaker who, you know, they knew that they were going to go on Hulu. And they, they had to shoot for iPads and tablets. And I'm like, oh, that's such the wrong way to go. But uh, we also I mean, saw two, 2001 Space Oddity, Odyssey where Hal was there. That's a different movie when you see it on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we just saw uh, Oppenheimer and, uh, and uh, oh, it was a Dune. Saw Dune yesterday. And uh, I, I can't. I can't imagine watching those on, on TVs. In fact, I haven't yet, either of those. I I mean, for you guys, uh, is I mean, what is the prospects do you see for for the for the movie theaters? Not just for the I big think, things, but for the uh, but for the family theaters, family owned theaters. I think people still show up to the theaters. I mean, there's no better experience than watching a film in a movie theater and some, I mean, we had huge box offices last year, so on a lot of, last year and a lot of films. Mm -hmm. And I think people are gonna continue going. Um, and I hope the momentum stays where more and more go. And, you know, we get back to how it was when Friday nights you would go to the movie theater, at, you know, once every two weeks or whatever it was. And, um, you know, I think it's more of an experience driven activity um watching a movie in the theater versus watching it at home there's so many interruptions at home you pause it you dog barks you you're distracted get up to get something to eat. distracted yeah. the whole time um so i you know my hope it would be that more and more people get back to that and realize you know it's your hour and a half lately some movies two and a half hours <laughs> time to escape the world and all the you know hardships that are going on in our world. It's a nice way to just disconnect and to go on a journey with a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So now that's a woman that's twenty nine years old. <laughs> that's the new yeah. generation. Yeah. Give or I take. Thank you for saying twenty nine. <laughs> <laughs> give or give or take a year, but. Yeah. But let me tell you from a business point of view, when we work with a director, whether it's like Nick Cassavetes, who's in his 60s, or we worked with Norman Jewison on Hurricane, who recently passed, yeah. or um, Madness of King George, or Lord of War with Andrew Nicole. When these are movies that we finance, produce, or finance and produce. Those movies make a big difference on the theater. However, where we are today, God is a bullet. We got several offers to premiere that movie on a streamer. Mm -hmm. But in a room, Nick Cassavetes and I shook our hands and said, I promise I will release this movie theatrically. You just saw the Jake Gyllenhaal movie where the director didn't go to South by Southwest because they were gonna stream it and not release it in theaters, right? But we <laughs> kept our word to our financial detriment and i do have some scars on my back from natalie reminding me of that <laughs> i'm not going to show them to you <laughs> but we kept our word we released that movie for nick cassavetes on 400 screens in between indiana jones 16 17 uh, 18 <laughs> and Mission Impossible seven. Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. so I believe it's seven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we released it between those two dates, mm -hmm. and we got exactly five days of theaters out of that. To which Nick and I flew to New York. 
went to the Regal theaters, flew to AMC theaters, flew all over the place for radio shows. But if your movie isn't Mission Impossible or Star Wars or Born or Marvel, it's hard to get more than a week out of a theater release, mm -hmm. which is a huge impact to us financially. Yeah. Yeah. I, I talked to uh, someone who books theaters and they are under intense pressure from the studios to have all their screens filled with their movies. And, uh, yeah, and it's very difficult to squeeze, squeeze uh, smaller films in like that. And I think it sounds like that's what you ran into. Yeah, I mean, it makes us want to buy theaters. I think Quentin, that owns Beverly Cinemas, and now he just bought the Vista down there on Sunset in uh, in Echo Park, or what is it, Los Feliz? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. I mean, we're thinking about the same thing. It seems like we need a theater in New York, Chicago, San Francisco, L.A., Dallas, um, Atlanta, Mm -hmm. And New Jersey. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't know how we release these movies where we can't hold it. They'll give us Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. What does that do for us? Yeah. Or if your movie's violent, and I'm not saying God is a bullet is violent, but I've heard it could be. You, you can't have the six show or the eight show. They'll only show it at 10, 30, and 12. Yeah. Well, how much money are we supposed to make back on the movie at 10, 30, and 12? Mm -hmm. And so that's a problem. And the guys that are releasing the movies from us, for us, they're 60 plus years old because they're the ones that know how to do it. You don't see a lot of 30 year olds releasing theatrical pictures. Mm -hmm. They're working for the streamers, Hulu, Netflix, Paramount Plus, Amazon. Amazon doesn't care if they release it theatrically. Sure, they bought MGM, but they don't they don't really care they care that prime sells mm -hmm. netflix cares that netflix sells and they're working they're making a lot of money but for us as filmmakers and financiers we go like this <laughs> yeah what yeah i know do yeah. What are well, you gonna I, do? I what can... are you gonna do, Alan? You're gonna get in front of it for us. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, I talk to these theaters. Well, look, the the theaters, uh, they are in the same boat as you are because they are being forced by the studios to play their movies, and no one's coming to watch them. And they are forced to, uh, you know, hold hold films for two to three weeks, uh, and uh, and no one's going to watch them. And uh, you know they, you know they love things like Sound of Freedom and uh, and Taylor Swift and Beyonce because people want to see those, and yet they don't have the they don't have the theater space because they're being forced by the studio to uh, to show their movies you know longer than they want to. Where are you located, Alan? Oh, I'm in uh, I'm in Orange County, so I'm not too far from LA. So let's find a theater to buy together. Yeah, <laughs> there's some. Uh, <laughs> We have one the Frida Frida Cinema out here, and they show they show everything. You uh, have Edwards time. too, right? Yeah, I think Edwards is part of the Regal system, though. Oh, they sold out, huh? Yeah. Then there's uh, Cinemark. They're 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 buying up a lot of the old Regals that are failing. Right, but Cinemark, for example, this summer they wouldn't show our movie. They said they're only showing studio movies during the summer. Mm-hmm. AMC and Regal were the only ones that would show our movie. Yeah. And some independents. Mm -hmm. And this is a movie with directed by Nicola Cassavetes, who did 
great movies. John Q, Notebook, Alpha Dog, you know. This had Jamie Foxx, Nikolai Costas Falder, mm -hmm. Micah Monroe, who's hotter than a new ingenue, super hot actress. Wasn't a studio, they weren't interested. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, quite frankly, it's the studios that the only AMC that shows that showed your film uh was the one with 30 screens in it because they needed the movie. Uh but I heard it was a good movie. Mm -hmm. It was a very good movie. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so now that we're lamenting the theaters, what, um, you know, what is the state now? You know, I mean, ultimately, it, it does go on streamers. Um, you know, how, where, how is? <laughs> I guess the the ultimate question is: Is the pressure there now to to have that shorter theatrical time and then? And then look for the best deal on the on the streamers, because that that industry itself is starting to change. Because it seems like everyone's moving to Netflix or everyone's moving to Tubi, and that some of the uh, you know some of the minor streaming platforms are starting to go away. Yeah, I mean, on my trip back from France, I stopped off in um, Munich to go see the Department of Generative AI at the mm -hmm. Techno Te Technological University of Munich, the, the MIT of Munich, of Germany. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions we talked about was, can you develop something that is as good or not better than the Netflix system of showing movies with all your AI fancy schmancies algorithm software mm -hmm. so we are currently looking into that but we might be a couple years late mm -hmm. so using ai to kind of be become the competition of netflix is that what you're saying to create an, a, an emerging efficiency for it mm -hmm. so we can create channels with some of the product that comes back to us mm -hmm. that we can also play in theaters because what happened to tv isn't tv gone too i mean the networks yeah sure they're playing a couple episodes but natalie don't you watch and your friends watch most of the tv series on a binge of netflix yeah, I would say so on the streaming platforms. I mean, I don't know really many people that still have cable. Um, they just pay for the multiple platforms. They don't even have cable. Right. Yeah. I mean, I watch CNN, so I have to have cable because I care about the news or whatever they call the news these days. I have to watch three, three or four channels just to get a midpoint in in <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, CNN is available on Max, so you, you can drop your cable there. Yeah. And what's that about? Can someone tell me how you go from HBO as a hall, Hallmark platinum label cable channel where the best shows in the world were made to taking that name and trashing it and calling it by my son's name, Max? <laughs> What's that? Uh, yeah. Rebranding. <laughs> Who gives up HBO for Max? I know. A, a winning brand for an unknown brand. Yeah. That's why that's why Natalie has to run the world. I'm <laughs> I'm gonna stay up in my tower here and just make old fashioned seventies movies. Mm-hmm. And finance the movies that the company makes under Natalie's leadership. Because clearly, Taxi Driver won't get done these days. Mm -hmm. Scarface is not going to get done. Apocalypse Now is not getting done. So what are they making? 
Well, the question is then, could could you make a Scarface or could you make a Godfather? Sure, I can make a Scarface. But is we it... have a we have a Scarface up to bat mm -hmm. about a cop. Scarface is a cop. Uh huh. But you know, Natalie might run me out of the country. <laughs> She's like, that's too violent. That's too real. Yeah, but isn't it? I, I mean, I keep telling people these days that maybe the big Hollywood studio is not the dream. Um, it, it, it seems like if those kind of movies are going to be made, it's from people like you, uh, who are who are not beholden to the, these, uh, you know, the, this monstrous corporate conglomeration, and, and you're just making movies. Uh, do you know, is is it possible that uh, that that kind of those kind of films will ever, you know, is is it a matter of just believing in those kind of films now and making it and bypassing the big studios altogether, or could be, or could, is it, it could be, but let's think about it as cooking. Like some people cook and they have the cookbook out. I don't know if that's you, Natalie, and it says uh, one pinch of this and a quarter teaspoon of that and three teaspoons of this and but I, I kind of cook the way my grandmother cooked where I kind of feel it and I taste it and I work with directors and filmmakers that do it that way also but I have to be honest we made a movie called Blackout with a, a new director Sam Macaroni And it was an action comedy when it started. And Josh Dumel is super funny. And Nick Nolte has a great sense of humor. And, and then by the time we showed it to the buyer, I won't tell you who that was, but you can look it up. Mm -hmm. Their logo goes, da <laughs> We got four pages of notes, right? Yeah. I had to go to the filmmaker. Of course, I didn't go alone. I brought Natalie and I said, well, you got to decide what you're going to do. This is the biggest streaming company in the world. Either we're going to cooperate and we'll work with them again, or we're not going to cooperate. And when we asked them where the notes came from, a lot of them were based on the acquisition departments collaboration with the algorithm computer they have and we ended up taking out the humor taking out the score changing the color changing everything to these notes and i have i'm happy to say it was number one on their streaming platform for several weeks mm -hmm. so they know what they're doing but it's a very different way of making movies do you feel like they were right or do you feel like they got lucky? No, I think they were right. Mm -hmm. It's like that movie that, uh, was it Jonah Hill who played the guy who did the statistics on the baseball player? Oh yeah, Moneyball. Moneyball. It's like Moneyball. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you actually have the data and you can call it up, you're going to be able to give your audiences what they viewed before. And that's the key. What did they view for 20 million hours before? Mm -hmm. And we have apparently from our six month analysis of our movies with Netflix, we had close to 50 million viewing hours of our movies. That's not bad, right? Mm -hmm. 50 million hours is a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. I think our last four movies did by themselves 30 million point something. That's a lot of hours. So I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it will tell you what people watched before. But is that how we want to make movies moving forward? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, moving forward implies what? Watching yeah. what they're going to watch. Which way is the thing? What they're going to watch. Not what they watched before. So how do we innovate? We have to take chances. And if we take chances, are we always right? No. I mean, Natalie is. I I'm not. <laughs> so I'm not always right. So what happens when I'm not right? I'll lose money. How many times can I lose money before I, before the red phone rings? Yeah. And what's up? Who's on the other line? The big boss. Hey, Michael. What's this losing money thing you're doing? You got such a good track record. How do we get it back there? Maybe we shouldn't take as many chances. Maybe those directors are too old. What's with all the violence? Can't we just make a nice movie? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's weird that uh, the company's... Uh, at the higher budget level uh, run by mice, uh, they seem to be okay with making movies that don't make money. <laughs> but in the independent world yeah. where we self-finance, mm -hmm. we can't do that too many times before the red phone rings. Yeah. And you have a feeling that they can't do it too many more times. Well, I mean, Mr. Stuber, who's done some really great work over the years, You know, probably had the best job in the business for a while until until he probably didn't want to listen to the algorithms anymore. Hmm. He certainly made big, expensive movies with huge stars. And subscription rates went up. Stock price went up. His salary went up. So he was doing something right from mm -hmm. a corporate standpoint. But then there's that Charlie Daniels song, Devil Went Down to Georgia, he was looking for a soul to steal. He was in a bind looking to find someone to make a deal. Right? Yeah. So if you're a filmmaker, you come with a certain soul, right? Filmmaking soul. If you're a streaming exec, you have to follow the algorithm. And now our business is done somewhere in that area. Where are we? Oh, over here. There's where we are. Let's get it to fit there. Right there. Can we do that? Natalie, can you get that movie right in that box? Right in there. Uh, there, right there. Ah, right there. <laughs> so now, Alan, you see that it is a threat to film. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a threat to the soul of the movie. It's not coincidence that Mr. Tarantino, who we financed Reservoir Dogs, who we financed uh, Half a Pulp Fiction, who we financed True Romance on his script. It's not coincidence. This great man, this great filmmaker is telling us he's got one movie left in him. I don't want to just see him do one movie. I, I want to see him do another 10. What about you, Alan? Yeah, I don't think you, if you're still creative, keep making movies. Uh, don't limit yourself. And it's, it's sad that he's kind of butt up against the uh, the system. You know, the, well, the I mean, I, I feel for him that Academy Awards where he had Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I thought he should have won. 
Mm -hmm. Instead, you know, Parasite won the best foreign film, which it was. And then all of a sudden they gave it to him to him again for best film. I think they could have just as easily given it to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood by Quentin. Mm -hmm. Or what, 1917? That was a good movie. Mm -hmm. But why they give two to one guy and zero to those guys? It's a threat, Alan. <laughs> it's a threat. It's been, sadly, it's been that way for a long time. I... And what, what's up with Greta? Greta should have got a Best Director nomination. Mm -hmm. What's up with that? <laughs> what's up with that, Alan? I know. Well, why do you think she didn't? Same reason when I go on the set and I see Natalie bossing around a bunch of people on a movie set to keep them on time and on budget. And three or four big guys are standing around kind of shouldering her. Same reason. No respect. No respect. <laughs> well, they feel threatened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no respect whatsoever. <laughs> Well, it was quite a feat on her part. Yeah, it was huge. It's terrible. It was huge. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you I understood all the male, female, patriarch thing because I didn't want to because mm -hmm. I'm part of that whole patriarch system. But oh, you broke my chair, Greta. <laughs> But this is the new generation right here, Natalie. Tough as nails. <laughs> we'll get, we'll get our time. It's a threat, Alan. Yeah, yeah to make a movie it? that everyone saw. And not the get whole credit. world. Yeah, the whole world saw. I mean, fewer people saw Oppenheimer, and that got, that got there. Well, you know who else suffered with from that is Spielberg also suffered from mm -hmm. that, right? Oh yeah, guy's a genius. He sees the world in a way everybody wishes they could see the world, but they denied him how many times? Yeah, I mean, Color Purple uh, should have been his. I don't know if he was even nominated, uh, but he definitely yeah, didn't work. Schindler's List, Color Purple. I mean, yeah. and and what's wrong with? Uh, a Spielberg movie where he has the cutting edge. He invents the cutting edge of dinosaurs running around eating mm -hmm. people. What's wrong with that? Yeah. No, and that movie. That movie set a. I mean, it proved that you could do. Uh, you could make movies with CG. It was it was a film that had never been made before. And remember, Empire of the Sun and. Mm -hmm. uh, and where's Bradley Cooper in that? I thought Bradley Cooper did a good job with Maestro. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, Maestro. You know, I I'm just I'm I'm kind of flabbergasted, but uh, that that movie's not doing better than it it should be. Because they want to make it about something else. His nose. Mm -hmm. What does his nose have to do with it? Yeah. As soon as you say it's about his nose being fake, mm -hmm. who's fake? Him or the person saying it? Mm -hmm. It's a threat, Alan. <laughs> Absolutely is. Well, with that, uh, I we need to end the end our conversation. But I appreciate Let's you. Let's not end <laughs> until you tell me who's our next president. Who's our next? <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> 
Oh, that's this what has become a political about. podcast. <laughs> yeah. Is this a is this a rematch? Yeah, well, it's definitely it, if I, I I'm pretty sure it's going to be a rematch. We've seen and then this. Then it should out. be on HBO if it's a rematch. Yeah, <laughs> well, we'll be on on Max. <laughs> You'll get the play by play on Max. Listen, uh, if you're in Orange County, I mean, I have a passport. Maybe we should all get together on the next movie. You should come to the set. Oh, absolutely. I'd love to do that. You know, there's a guy you should meet. He's a friend of mine, George Lee. He's been making American Asian movies. Mm -hmm. Oh. We had dinner with... Andrew Koji, have you seen Warriors, the TV yeah. show? Yeah, in fact, I saw his, uh, he was in another movie that played uh, uh, Toronto. Uh, and uh, it was it, a, a really, oh, with Andrew Sarsgaard. And uh, he was I almost unrecognizable, but he was great in it. I love Andrew Koji, great actor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, it just reminds me, I need to see Warrior. I need to see the second season of Warrior. Great. It's great. Yeah. If you watch it, we'll have a party. We'll have a Warriors party. Oh, yeah. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a threat, Alan. <laughs> it is a threat. And we're here to, to call it out. All right. Well, again, thank you for thank you for having this conversation. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Thank you.